Welcome to this episode of the AEC Engineering and Technology Podcast, a podcast dedicated to helping engineering professionals find technology that fits their needs. In this episode, I'll be speaking with John Gilfoyle, Chief of Technology and Innovation at Stanley Consultants, about the journey, challenges, and triumphs of Stanley's innovation program. We'll explore topics ranging from the program's inception and goals to its approach to innovation and AI integration. Before we get started, here's a quick word from our sponsor for today's episode, Stanley Consultants. For over a century, Stanley Consultants has been at the forefront of engineering innovation, relentlessly committed to improving lives and building a resilient future. We collaborate with government agencies, utility providers, and private industries to solve some of the most complex challenges in energy, infrastructure, and more. We put people first, leveraging cutting edge technology and multidisciplinary expertise to deliver differently and exceed expectations. Be a part of our journey to create a connected, sustainable, and enriched world for all. Get in touch with our Stanley Consultants team today. Okay, it's now time for our conversation of the week with John Guilfoyle. John, thank you so much for joining, joining us on the show today and welcome. Happy to be here, Nick. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, John, let's jump right into it. So, could you talk a little bit about your career journey and how it led to your current role here at Stanley Consultants? Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. It's a, it's a, it's a bit circuitous, so uh, I'll try to keep it short. Um, so, I'm currently Stanley's Chief of Technology and Innovation. I started my career doing something very different. Um, my grad, my undergraduate work, graduate work is in anthropology of all things. So I actually worked as an archaeologist for five or 10 years before switching to the field of technology. But I tie all of my interest in things that enable uh, progress, that help people craft things, that help people be better at, at living their lives. So there's, so there's elements of that in archaeology, but that flows right through into all the technolo- technological work I've done over the last probably 25 years as well. So uh, around the dot-com uh, boom, I got into the, the, the um, sort of, you know, web development, programming, et cetera, but rapidly got into the AEC space after just a couple of years of doing development when I realized uh, programming isn't for me. I'd rather do project management. I'd rather understand the needs and the benefits that these software tools provide to different businesses. So since about 2003, I've worked specifically in the AEC space, uh, most often on the consultant side. So I've usually been, you know, over my career, helping uh, utilities, municipalities, states, government agencies with the, the understanding of the software that's on the market that can meet their needs, helping them select it, helping them deploy it, et cetera. So I had about a 20-year a career doing that. Um, was on the road all the time, was all over the world consulting. And when the opportunity came along at Stanley, I really saw sort of the, um, the CEO and I saw very much eye to eye on things. We'd worked at a previous firm together before and had, had done, I think, pretty good things at that firm. So we really saw an opportunity to take um, Stanley, which was a 110-year-old, you know, very solid business um, working in energy, transportation, uh, water, um, DOD, federal type work, but really to sort of uh, look at it critically and figure out where do we need to take this business? How can we enable it with technology into the 21st century? So I came on board with Stanley using those consulting skills that I used with clients for a long, long time and have been focused for the past four and a half years or so on the uh, you know the work inside Stanley, the way that we deliver projects, so our back office processes, all those sorts of things. So I, I think I described to you, Nick, before we, we started our recording here, I've got three different groups under my wing. I, I run IT, I have an innovation program, and we have an analytics practice as well. Um, so all of the work that I did you know, over my career has sort of landed me here and with the ability to understand the business pretty deeply but also have always have an eye towards our clients and our communities because I work with them for so long. So I think I have a pretty good understanding of what our project teams today, what they're trying to do as they, you know, produce deliverables and they design infrastructure for all those, all those sectors that I described. Great, great summary just to how you've gotten to this point, John. And as we were talking about earlier, right? Like these innovation programs or departments within larger EC companies are relatively young, right? In Stanley's case, within the past couple of years for what is a 110-year-old firm. But John, what was the primary motivation or need behind establishing Stanley's, Stanley's innovation program? And how does that align with the broader goals of the company? 
So it comes straight from our strategy and the vision of the CEO and the executive team um, who recognize that uh, you know the the economy is changing, uh, our our clients' needs are changing, technology is changing. So we wanted to make sure we weren't left behind. And we also, uh, Nick, we identified early on at Stanley's size, about 900,000 people. We can't necessarily go head to head with the larger engineering companies that are out there. The, you know, the 30, 40, 50, 60,000 person companies. So we very much had a, a strategy of not imitation, but disruption and reinvention and looking at things in a different way. So how can Stanley bring our, be- you know, our best uh, and brightest forward on all of our projects. So rather than being siloed and working, you know, in inside individual sectors, how do we leverage our best ideas across the entire company? And then critically, we may get into this when we talk about the, 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 you know, the guts of our innovation program, how do we reach outside the company when we need to, to bring in expertise that we can leverage to help our clients solve their problems. Um, but it was, it was very much core, you know, core to our mission right now is this innovation program. It's something we take very seriously. So for example, when we um, found an, an innovation partner to provide a te- technology platform, we signed a three-year deal with those guys. We, we, we weren't sticking our toe in the water. We were going all in saying, we're gonna develop a program that goes soup to nuts, cradle to grave across a variety of different spaces, which I'm, I'm happy to talk about in terms of how we break our innovation program down, what we look at, that sort of thing. Yeah, and that's that's actually going to be the next question, John. Right? Can you walk us through how the innovation program operates, and like specifically, what problems is it designed to address? I can. So the the first thing that we did, the CEO and I sat down um, and really looked at what we wanted this program to accomplish inside the company with our with our clients, you know, with our com- with with the communities that we work in. And we look at it pretty simply. There's internal innovation that we can do, which is about Stanley, right? So we want to make sure that we are optimizing our internal processes, that we have smooth running, efficient processes that our staff are not frustrated with, that there's not a lot of waste. We're being as good as we can with our time. This includes things like payroll and HR and finance and IT and those sorts of things. But the internal view also includes a view of our members themselves, so our staff. So we have innovation challenges that we run around how to make Stanley a better place to work, make it a more attractive place to, to get the right people in the door and have them want to stay while they're here. Contrast that with, um, we look outward facing as well, which is basically we want to innovate on our projects, right? Our project teams, our engineers, our project managers, our field staff. We want to make sure that we have in- innovations in place that are supporting a better more efficient and optimized delivery of uh, those projects. Um, the last thing I would say, the, you know, the most aspirational uh, way that we look at it is in brand new services, brand new offerings, brand new approaches. So these are the, the clean sheet, blue sky thinking that's much harder, but you can picture that the, the innovation program goes all the way from the smallest improvements where we're, all we're doing is changing a business process and we're saving some time all the way up through trying to solve some of the world's largest industry problems around public health and those sorts of things. I can I can talk about some specific examples there. I guess the the last thing I would say, Nick, in terms of how the program has come together and how we how we look at things, is we, we very much have these different levels of how we innovate, um, and a lot of it's around sort of a, a challenge a challenge framework where we pose a question and we want to get the best ideas from everybody we can. Um, the pandemic was a big driver of changing the way that um, we looked at that because all of work has changed, right? We're no longer all in offices. So we couldn't we couldn't rely on sort of as many shark tank type scenarios where we bring everyone together and have a have a big group meeting for a, for a week and get our best ideas. We wanted something that we were we were allowing people to connect in virtually and we were also hearing every voice inside the company. So we carefully chose a partner who had a platform that allowed us to get the most junior members voice heard or the person who's brand new to the company and hasn't built their networks yet, but they have great ideas, right? So the challenge would would focus everybody on a specific thing we're trying to solve, no matter what either market or what part of the back office it's in. And then the platform allows us to kind of go everywhere inside the company. But from there, we then looked at what about those situations where Stanley doesn't have all the answers? We're not so, you know, um, obnoxious as to assume that we can solve everything. We are a company of engineers, so we're going to try. And we have 
uh, you know, an amazing track record in that regard. But the CEO and I really wanted to make sure we were able to add to our network of solvers. So in other words, if a client had some other engineering companies or consultancies, or even wanted to bring the regulator to the table, we have the ability in our, in our um, innovation program to do what's called co-creation. So we bring together a multi-discipline, multi-company team to solve problems. And then the third tier from there is we can actually stretch up to what's called open innovation. And this is where you reach into a crowd of about a half million or three quarters of a million solvers. And these are, these are experts in many fields who help solve problems for cash prizes. So you, you, you will put up an open innovation award to try and solve some very aspirational, very big picture item, get a bunch of ideas back, make some awards, and then you can move out with those solution providers to try and actually solve the problem uh, for real, not just during the, you know, not in the theoretical sense uh, during the challenge. So I, I think a pretty, a pretty holistic way of looking at innovation is what we're, what we develop. Absolutely. And, and John, you, you started to get into essentially my next question, right? Is who gets involved at the innovation program at Stanley and how do you foster a culture of collaboration? And what I loved about your last response is you're, you're giving credit to those, right? Junior members, like you said, of the organization, maybe haven't built up their network a lot. They have great ideas and can still bring them to the table. But beyond that, who else is getting involved? Well, let me, let me, um, let me talk a little bit about that. Um, and then uh, hopefully I'll widen my answer out to include the other pieces, but the, that piece is really important to us. Um, and you probably know this, Nick, from working with a bunch of engineering companies during your during your podcast. Engineering companies can be pretty hierarchical. It can be pretty difficult to break through what we see as kind of a clay layer of you know department managers, mid mid level managers, who are quite frankly you know the the backbone of the industry. They're they're the people who have 10, 15, 20 years of experience. They're great, but in this day and age where technology is changing so fast, there are so many different approaches to things, and and with between between climate and the economy and the, you know, the new challenges that are emerging, we have to look at some things differently. So we need all those ideas. And that's where we absolutely get to that. We want to hear every single voice. Um, but to your, to your more direct question about, you know, how do some others get involved type of thing? When we run these challenges, we always have to have a sponsor. We have to have a challenge manager. So what that means is if someone is going to run, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, one of our, one of our markets ran a challenge around how do we better attract staff to our team and keep them, right? So we had a specific sponsor who was on board who would be the person who will help implement any ideas that get approved coming out of that challenge. So it's one thing to generate great ideas. You're not really innovating unless you act on them, right? So a big part of this is actually figuring out how to carry these ideas through. So if 50 ideas are generated by 100 people, uh, we might settle on a top three that we're going to move forward with. The sponsor and the challenge manager know the most about that from the market. I have a team on the innovation side of things who will sort of foster things along and make sure that um, all the people in the business who need to be aware are made aware if there's going to be some impacts. In fact, we're rolling out some improvements right now, kind of a version two of our program, where we are introducing a formal business review so that if a market, let's take our water market, for example, comes up with uh, some you know big ideas they want to make changes to either our IT systems or they want to make an investment in, you know, in some consulting to improve their business, et cetera. Um, we have a pretty structured way now to get the overall approval and alignment of the business. Because as, as you can imagine, even in a company, you know, a mid-sized company, Stanley's size, there are a lot of initiatives going on at any one time. So we want to be careful that we are not sort of, you know, uh, doubling up and trying to trying to solve the same problem in multiple areas. So the innovation program is starting to become this sort of clearinghouse for where you bring those ideas. So whereas we used to have HR running their own initiatives around onboarding, for example, and improving the onboarding process, we're able to use the innovation program, which we call Innovate at Stanley, as the, the fulcrum around which we swing all of those types of improvements. So when someone comes up with a with an improvement initiative coming out of a challenge, if there's, if there's something already in flight, we just plug them into that. So we're able to really sort of cross-connect across the business. But um, the other piece is that if I widen this out to, to, you know, to further answer your question, we're actually looking at our retirees. We're looking at the way that we have some subcontractors or some partners that we work with all the time, right? Um, every engineering company has their go-to providers, whether it's a uh, small business or minority-owned business, or whether it's niche services around 
LIDAR or drones or whatever it might be. And this is the co-creation stuff I was talking about and where we get, we take the Stanley core and we widen it out to include, include a whole different group of people, right? So we're able to sort of magnify the, you know, the problem solving power and engineering power that we have um, with the platform. Which is and a great response. And, and John, the, the point I'll highlight and will lead us to our next question is, right, ideas are great, but innovation comes when you actually execute and can apply, you know, the, the su successful implementation of those ideas into the business, right? So then that leads us to our next question. How does Stanley measure the success of its innovation program? That's a great question. And it's one we, we've worked on for, you know, the innovation program has been up and running for almost three years now. Um, the first year was actually pretty slow going because that was right when everyone went home to, because of the pandemic. So we had a bit of a, a six month kind of breather where we, we had to make sure everybody was okay at their, you know, just ran, run the business basically. So about two years or so that we've been, we've been doing it, uh, by now. And, you know, there's some classic measurements around an innovation program like this, where you're trying to measure engagement, you know, with staff to make sure you're getting value for the money you're spending on the program. You're getting the best ideas out of it. Those are the simplest things to, to capture, right? How many challenges have we run? How many people have been involved? How many markets have run challenges in it over a given course of, of a, you know, of a year? And we have a lot of those metrics, but what the CEO and I rapidly uh, came to is that we wanted to have some metrics that talked about the impact on the business. And those are the ones that vary depending on the type of challenge that we're running. So I mentioned earlier on that we, we have these internal challenges and these outward facing challenges customer focus versus Stanley focus. So you can picture that if we're trying to save time and money on the, on the internal side of things, we are literally looking at counting labor hours that we're saving. We are literally looking at, you know, um, if we're able to innovate and do something differently, maybe we can now have a contract in place with, with an external provider. We can cut that funding. We can actually, you know, use those monies elsewhere. Right? So we actually have a dollar value we track for how much we are saving. We have a, we have a number of hours. The best example I've got there, the first challenge that we ran was in our, in our finance and accounting group. And that team identified immediately, uh, about a half an FTE. So about a thousand hours of work a year, they could cut out on their process by making changes over about a two or three week period. So they made those changes and we recognized that immediately. So we are, we are tracking those types of, uh, metrics or on the internal side. Around the external side, it's all about sort of efficiency. So if an engineering project task takes us um, 500 hours to accomplish, right? We are, we are trying to find, and there are lots of them out there right now, um, AI and other technologies that allow us to do what we, what we call deliver differently. And that means do that same block of 500 hours. Can you do it in 400 if you are assisted by some technology that will either provide templates or do or do 20% of the design or whatever it might be. So the way we're measuring that stuff is these efficiencies we're getting around our projects. So the way that we, you know, the way that we actually do our client work, we're trying to make our project teams more efficient and we're tracking, you know, uh, efficiency numbers. And then finally, when we're talking about brand new service offerings, there's a pretty clear metric there and that is revenue. So we can actually put it right down to a dollar value of revenue we would not have had if we didn't have the innovation program, run the challenge, develop a new service offering and find the new customers. And there's, you know, there's a bunch of nuances to it too, but I don't want to go into gory detail on, on how to track it, but there's, there's different ways to track it depending on what you, uh, concerned about what you're trying to align with. Right. And, and John, and like you mentioned, right, there's different ways to track it, but it sounds like to me, no matter what your, what the end goal is or what you're, what you're trying to accomplish, like you have hard data to support was this was this a success or does it need more work or whatever the conclusion is, right? You have some hard data to support it. We do. And it, I will be, you know, totally transparent and honest with you. There are lots of challenges that run that either don't produce the results that we want or produce results that are really hard to measure because, you know, we use the program in a number of ways and some of them are very, very much like cut and dry. Like how do we get more efficient, right? We get a whole bunch of ideas about things we can do differently, about new technology we could use, about new people we can partner with pretty cut and dried. Other ones are more about like, how do we improve engagement? I'll give you, I'll give you a good example. Our young professionals group just is in the middle of running a challenge right now. So we are evaluating the ideas that came back about how to get better engagement from the, the young professionals in the business who are not part of the group already. So a company family size, we're a relatively young business in terms of the age of our, of our staff. 
So there's a few hundred people who are in that YPG group. And we only have about a hundred who are really steadily engaging. So they've run some challenges around how do we improve that, right? And that includes everything from different events to um, making sure that we are, when people are onboarded to the company, they're made really aware of what the YPG is and what it does, what benefit it provides, et cetera. Um, and as you can imagine, we're, it's harder to measure that impact, right? And the same thing is true. I mentioned earlier, we, we run challenges for like member engagement and member, you know, improving the, improving the experience at Stanley. Without doing surveys, sort of pulse surveys and continually doing them, it's difficult to have quantitative data to be able to say, how are we doing in that regard? So I don't want to pretend like we have, uh, you know, excellent metrics, hard metrics for everything that we do. It's a, it's a goal we strive for and wherever we can, we absolutely do. And, and, you know, I think you would say as well, John, right? Like everything that you do in the innovation space, like you may have a vision of what it looks like. And then there's of course the reality of how it ends up, but the fact that you're trying to measure everything quantitatively is, is a good start. Cause then at least you could point to a, hey, like we have this idea, this is what we did. And this was the end result, which I think helps a lot, especially, you know, senior leaders who are looking for that type of information to measure the success of essentially right their return on investment on, on whatever the initiative is. Yep. Yep, absolutely. I, I, guess, I guess the only thing I would add there is I'm pretty proud of the company and the work that we've done here. This is not easy. And then, you know, you have to you have to have intestinal fortitude. You have to be brave because you're going to fail in some cases. And we you know through the first year of our program, we, we we're making some significant changes as we move into the, you know, uh, our third our third year here based on lessons learned and whatnot. But um, the company took the risk to say we can't afford to not do this. Right. So we're just having to make sure that we have kind of a continual improvement angle that we're looking at and we're improving things. So for example, the first year, the first year of metrics, we weren't happy with, we weren't happy with how we were tracking them. So we revisited that, uh, just this past summer, in fact, and we've developed a whole new set of metrics that are tied to these challenge types that we are collecting out going forward. So it's, it's very much about being able to stick with it because it's a core part of our strategy, but not just blindly following along with what we established in the early days, but making improvements to it as we go. And, and John, you've mentioned risk, right? And the idea of like, it's risky to innovate and do things differently than the norm, but it is also risky to do things as they've always been and stick with the status quo, which leads us into our next question about AI, right? Probably the biggest, you know, two letter buzzword in every industry as of late, particularly as consumer products have come to the market, right? And these tools are very easy to use just for like the regular person. Like, how does it fit into Stanley's innovation program? And are there any specific AI-driven projects or initiatives you'd like to tell us about? Um, yeah. So, as you might imagine, uh, in in my role, when this, you know, we I, we we've been watching this for a while. I'll say that. So, back actually in 2019, Kate Harris, our CEO, correctly identified the whole industry has a problem with not having enough talent to meet to fill all the roles that we need. Right? Whether it's electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, whatever whatever it might be. Right. So there's a, there's a bit of what, what's called a war on talent uh, to find the right people and to keep the right people. So she challenged our business at a, in a theoretical way. So it's kind of, a, kind of a, you know, clear your slate and think broadly about how you might solve this. How can we deliver our work with fewer people? So how can we not shrink if we have not as many engineers as we want, or how can we grow at the rate that we, that we aspire to, right? And we came up with, at that time, I led the team that did this, this idea of delivering differently using technology. And this includes little things like, if you're familiar with it, things like robotic process automation and traditional systems integration, where you have little bots that can be behind the scenes in your back office, and they're doing some rote things that alleviate some of the drudgery that your staff might be having to go through, right? But all the way up through computer vision uh, attached to cameras on construction sites that are, that are watching in the same way that a safety officer might or a construction manager might. They are making the same sorts of observations and noting them and, and, and even counting quantities. So it's very much an automation play when you get into that level of AI. And then fast forward a couple of years and you get the, you know, the open AI uh, breaking the gates open with ChatGPT and the various image generation tools that are out there right now. And it's, you know, it's wide open right now, right? So for years, we have been partnering with and looking for technologies that will help us on the engineering side of things. So in other words, how can we, in our traditional business where we're doing design engineering, 
how can we enable our staff to to um, respond faster, design faster, design at higher quality with enabling technologies, right? And then more recently with the large language model type stuff like ChatGPT, which we've we've already brought in house. Quite frankly, we found a, a preferred partner that has a more business focused sort of solution that is uh, less risky and is better with our data. So it doesn't just share our data if we if we put it into the system. And we're already using that, uh, you know, in anger. Uh, in our business development area, right? So we're already like off and running. We we actually started that program about nine months ago, just a few months after ChatGPT really took the world by storm. Uh, I've been sort of keeping a pulse on a variety of different AI areas, but when that hit, I'm like, this is going to change. This is going to change everything, right? And the reason why I say that is not just it's not just the text part of it. It's not just the generation and the summarization capabilities that it has and the ability to ask it questions and get answers back. But there's going to be some multimodal things going on, which mean you can provide an image and it will comment back, or you can ask it to do something like create a video and it will do that, right? Where you're, you're changing formats. And then the last part of that from the research that I've been doing lately is that regular applications like the video application we're using right now will become enabled on the front end. So you can do things like start the video, say that, start the transcript. And all of these features will just, you'll just use plain language to actually interact with the software. It'll take time for that to bleed into the engineering space, but it's coming. It, it, there will absolutely be AI that, that does the parametric design type stuff that we've seen for a few years now, right? That's getting better and better all the time. And there are a whole bunch of startup companies that are really moving the ball on that. But I happen to think that just the core stuff like the Esri, Autodesk and Bentley software will eventually be enabled with these tools that simply make them easier to use. And all of this is around productivity gains, quality improvements, and that sort of thing. You know, we've got a couple of partners that we work with right now on, on the water side. Uh, we're looking at some partnering on the energy side of things, uh, you know, down in the weeds on like allowing us to do like a 30% design on a wastewater treatment plant, for example. And we can produce that rapidly can produce 20 of those depending on the inputs that we give it. So we're already off and running on some of that stuff and are looking to kind of increase the partnerships that we have there. But on the, you know, the flip side, which is the consumer stuff you're talking about, the, that large language model chat GPT stuff, if we don't, if we don't have a policy around that and we don't figure out how to enable our staff, how to use it for the business, they're going to do it themselves because it makes it that, that software makes certain, you know, drudgery type tasks so easy. So if we don't, if we're not out in front of it and enabling our staff with it, we're we're sort of putting ourselves uh, both behind the curve and also a little bit at risk because some of those tools you do not want to put your proprietary information into, your client information too. So you have to be careful with that stuff. John, I love the examples, and for anyone you know in the audience listening today, um, we have had a couple of episodes that touch on some of the topics that John's talked about, right? Using machine learning as an example, right, to get you a pretty rapid DD set for, let's say, like a steel frame office building. Yep. Or as John mentioned, right, like a 30% design set for a wastewater treatment plant. My my field of expertise is probably going to be changed the most via computer vision, right, um, uh, solutions for inspection. But I think the, yeah. the overarching theme here is, hey, like no matter what industry you're in, right, AI is coming, it's going to have an impact. And whether you like it or not, things are going to change. So it's best to at least have an understanding of where things are going, right? And in Stanley's case, have somebody like John leading the charge and making sure that it fits into the core business and and works out. Yep, absolutely right. I mean, the, our innovation program exists, Nick, because we, we, we knew that if, if you're not looking at all of these changes that are out there, you're going to get left behind. You're, you know, we have to help our the owners of the infrastructure here, right? The asset owners, our clients, we have to help them get there as well because they've got funding issues, they've got aging infrastructure issues, they've got service level issues, all sorts of stuff. And quite frankly, trying to evaluate what's out there has become kind of a nightmare because there's so many products on the market. Some of them are going to be around, some of them are going to get you know gobbled up as, as acquisition comes along. So we have to have a dedicated way of, of looking at it. So I will also say this, in addition to the work that Stanley's doing, I have some partners that I work with that can help keep me abreast of this stuff because it's all moving so quickly, right? So we've got our innovation program very focused on certain things, but I've also got 
a little more pure, like technology efficiency wise, we're looking at some other things, but we're going to marry those things, which I'm, I'm very pleased about. So in the coming year, we're actually going to be running a bunch of innovation challenges specifically around AI and how the company can make use of it. Because I think this gets back to the stuff we talked about at the beginning of the call. We have people in the business who are junior engineers who have just come in who have ideas about the work that they're doing, especially the plotting type work where they're just having to do it over and over again. They will have ideas from technologies they've seen elsewhere or that they're using in their daily life. And we want to hear about that and capitalize on it. Absolutely. And this and this segues really nicely into our next question, John. So every innovative journey has its own set of challenges. What have been some of the significant challenges you face in running the program and what have you learned um, from them? Yeah, there's there's no shortage of challenges. That's that is for sure. And it all starts actually with the AEC space that we're in. All these companies, Stanley included, are full of people who pride themselves on being the experts in their areas, right? They're, they are hired to solve these types of problems, to design them, to construct them, to operate them. Uh, so it, it's a ch it's a big challenge. We're not it, we're not like say the pharmaceutical in industry where there are big dollars hanging out there for whoever can innovate the next drug, right? And I, I say that for a reason around pharmaceutical because pharmaceutical industries are the first ones who really started to use these open innovation networks that I talked about, where they thought about the fact that hey, we have ten thousand employees. But there are 50,000 other experts in the world who might help us innovate the next product, right? So there's a big challenge inside of an engineering company to help the engineers understand that maybe their ideas are not the only ones that we should be looking at, right? Um, we want to leverage them. But the interesting thing about that open innovation that I mentioned is something like more than 50% of the time when a challenge is solved at that level, and I'm talking about the solver network that has three quarters of a million people in it, right? It has doctors, chemists, engineers, mathematicians, IT experts. More than half the time, it's somebody not in the in the uh, the field of the challenge who solves the problem. The, the the best one being, the best example being when the Exxon Valdez oil cleanup was happening. Towards the tail end of that, there was a big spill at the, you know, way down on the seabed in this slurry of half frozen water where they could not figure out how to separate the oil from the seawater. So it sat for 20 years. It sat for years with no, no good solution. And when a company finally ran an open innovation challenge around how to remove that oil, someone who knew construction techniques around concrete mixing figured out the vibration needed to separate the oil from the water at that depth. And then they cleaned it up. And it was someone completely outside, completely outside of, you know, uh, oil drilling and a cleanup and all that sort of stuff. And that's, you know, so the, so the challenge you, you face, quite frankly, is skepticism thick from our, you know, from our business. So there's all sorts of ways to crack that nut around finding champions, helping people be successful with the innovation, making it safe for them to innovate so that we've got some funding, you know, set aside so we're not spending their own market dollars on solutions and that sort of thing, that we've got tremendous executive support. So both from myself from our CEO, from every executive on the floor that I work on, believe strongly in this program. So it's got high profile, it's well communicated. You need all those things. If you try to do this sort of on the down low in an engineering company, the antibodies will rapidly kill it. Uh, and that's simply because of the way engineering companies operate, right? They just, their our work is to take on problems and solve them. And we even see challenges around the, the mid-level of challenges I've talked about, these co-creation where we have partners where we may want to bring in some of our retirees, we want, to, we want to bring in some subs. You know, people have professional pride in that stuff, but there's no way to know every solution that's out there. And with the way that, as I mentioned before, climate change, the economy, politics, the way all of this stuff is so volatile right now, we have to make sure that we have, you know, our best foot forward with all the ideas. Which is, you know, is is a kind of a, a great summary there, John. And, and I can speak from experience, right, that, running these innovation programs on on the download engineering companies and the antibodies come in because unless there really is support from the top down and and resources both time and dollars allocated um yeah i can speak from for personal experience that it, it does not it's not an easy thing to begin with and then if you don't have the necessary resources it's almost impossible to to actually do and and what i love also about your response is the openness and the collaboration because so so often in the industry, like we're, we're, I think as an industry, we're very collaborative at a high level, 
But when it comes down to that, you know, nitty gritty problem solving and processes, a lot of it is kept tight to the chest. Of course, you don't want to show all of your cards, right? But the fact that you guys run innovation challenges, collaborate with other companies, I think speaks a lot to, you know, how successful your program is going to be. Because you're right, you know, not all of the answers are going to come from within inside of your firm. Sure. I mean, Nick, we're running a business as are all of our competitors, right? So we'll be... We'll be smart about that side of it. But when you get right down to it, we're about solving these client, community, city, utility problems around infrastructure, right? And there's a lot of value to be gained by using that as the focus and then putting Stanley and the other companies in the client supply chain, put them all together in, and run a challenge. And now you have, you know, the, the best example of this is when we when we do program management type type offerings where... You know, there's an owner's engineer who sits on top of a whole bunch of our design engineers who sit on top of some prime, you know, construction contractors, but you've got this sort of hierarchy of businesses and there's a tremendous amount of expertise in all of those businesses. So if you can access all of it, it's really a benefit for the client and for quite frankly, the built world, right? This is where you get into like, we care about the, the, the communities that we live in. We're trying to make this a, a better place for us all to live. And, um, I think it's, I think it's pretty key. One final quick note to what you said a minute ago just kind of clicked in my head. Uh, interestingly, when I arrived at Stanley, there were there were the remnants of an innovation program in place, but it suffered from what you had just said. There was no funding for it. There was no ownership. There was no executive support. So, you know, the first thing you have to do to launch a program is get those pieces sort of identified. Like, who's responsible for it? Make sure the executives are on board. Get it properly funded. Find the right enabling technology to do it. If you're in the sort of situation that we're in where half of our staff are hybrid or are working on projects or whatever, so we're not in offices all the time, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and John, my final question for today is going to be, um, been pointed and I think really great for the audience, but like what piece of advice would you give to engineers who are looking to drive innovation in their fields? That's a, that, yeah, that's an interesting one. I do think that these wider, how, how do I phrase this? These wider networks of solvers that are out there that I, that I have mentioned those can be, you can be looking at those networks and seeing what industry problems are, are, are out there that are trying to be solved. So good examples of those, there are invasive fish species in the Great Lakes, right? And people have tried for years to figure out how to get rid of those. It's these open innovation challenges that have solved those. So if you're looking as someone in the field to try to figure out like where's the edge of some of the innovation there's all of the traditional, I think, engineering structures that we have around, whether you're in the water, energy, oil and gas, transportation, those markets all have, you know, think tanks and groups that that look very much at the state of the art on things. One of the best examples I'll, I'll mention on the water side of things, there's a tremendous amount of people working on PFAS right now, right? So the, the way that we looked at doing exactly what you're su suggesting here, but for our own staff, let me, let me, let me answer the question this way. There are lots of startups and lots of PhDs who are working on that problem, right? And we actually have run an open innovation challenge around this, specifically the PFAS challenge, the, the uh, sequestration of it, the, the cleanup, the destruction of it, right? No one's licked it yet in a way that is really affordable and is really repeatable, scalable across the entire, entire water sector. In going through that challenge, um, we were able to take our water team, who had done a little bit of work in that space so far, but who were more traditional water treatment, conveyance, uh, uh, transmission distribution, re water resourcing, et cetera, and really embed in them and get them upskilled on a like the very edge of the field right now where people are trying to innovate and fix things. So we did two things. We both ran the challenge and we are currently evaluating the ideas that we got back from that. But we also went out and met all of these niche providers who already have fledgling solutions who are looking to pilot somewhere. And we went and looked at the universities around who have people who are uh, doing research at that level, at the PhD level for uh, these chemical water processes. So it really kind of opened up things as opposed to working on your, your, your project day after day, your pipeline, your uh, pump station, your treatment plant. We are involving them in these projects that are more aspirational and you know we're lifting our eyes a bit, right? And we're trying to solve an industry problem in addition to solving a specific project problem, right? Now, beyond that, Nick, there are communities to join. There are conferences to attend, all the classic stuff, right? 
I guess, I guess what I would say is we're never going to get to a point in the next, next few years here, I don't think, where an AI tool is stamping a job, right? We're always going to want to have that, that care, that professional care, the, um, all of the things that go along with the engineering the licensure and the professional nature of the job are not going to go away. But you better get up to speed on how you can be enabled with all these technologies that are emerging, right? So understand what pieces of the uh, job are going to get automated or going to get simplified, and then understand where people, humans, will continue to provide tons of value, right? It's, you know, we we have no, our, our program, I mentioned that in 2019, we first developed this delivered difficult program. I had some skeptical people in the room looking at me as I described robotic process automation, as I described drones, as I described AI, doing, and like, quite frankly, one of the things that's still coming is project management tasks. A lot of project management tasks are going to get automated. People were skeptical. They are less skeptical now. And to combat that skepticism, I, I hope this is sort of on line with your point here. I, I had to make the point that we are, we're never looking to downsize or replace people with this technology. What we're looking to do is augment them and make, make you better, stronger, faster, uh, higher quality, better output, um, better, better, quite, quite frankly, better uh, balance of like work, work life balance type thing, right? Because if you have a huge workload, these tools are going to help balance that and take off some of those mundane things that you're having to do as part of the job. It's never going to get rid of the smart people that we need to lead the industry and the solutions, right? Well said, John. And, and I, I completely agree, right? And it's like the the bots or the or AI may be coming for specific tasks, but any intelligent company knows their people are still at the core of it. And the, the discussion of like the, the great point you mentioned, right? Like AI signing and sealing drawings. Like, yep. Could you imagine the the laws that would be the, the you know the laws that would need to be changed to even make that like, exactly possible, right? So there there's more of a hurdle of then can it be done, right? So um, excellent advice, John. And I'm sure, you know, if listeners are, you know, have any more questions, right. About what conferences groups to join, you can of course ask John, ask me or any of us here at EMI, but John, you know, where, where can the listeners find you if they want to, you know, ask more questions, follow up on anything you said, um, in today's interview, uh, LinkedIn is the best, the best route, John, you know, John Guilfoyle, uh, with Stanley, you'll find me there. Excellent. So John, thank you so much again for joining us today. I think this conversation was awesome. You've really given our our listeners and you know a look into Stanley, its innovation program, and some really practical ideas to to kind of take forward and and do in our own careers. And I know I have a have a couple in mind here. So thank you again for joining us. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, to tell you about the program. We're we're pretty excited about it. Absolutely. And I'm sure we'll we'll talk again. So until next time, John, thank you. Please remember, you can find the show notes for this episode at aectechpodcast.com. There, you will find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, as well as links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned during this episode. Until next time, I wish you the best in all of your engineering and technology endeavors. Thank you.